Welcome to MIT Supply Chain Frontiers, where we discover the future of global supply chain education, research, and innovation. Brought to you by the MIT Center for Transportation and Logistics, every episode features center researchers and staff who welcome experts from the field for in-depth conversations about business, education, and beyond. Today, CTL research scientist and sustainable supply chains director Alexis Bateman speaks with Erez Agmoni, head of Supply Chain Warehousing and Distribution America at Maersk. Take it away, Alexis. Today, we're really fortunate to have Dr. Agmoni with us. He is the regional head of distribution and warehousing for Maersk. He has a bachelor's, master's, and PhD from Assumption University in Thailand, and 20 years in logistics and supply chains. Thank you, Alexis. As Alexis mentioned, I'm uh, looking after uh, the warehousing and distributions for, for Maersk for North America. Uh, I did a few different uh, roles uh, in the company. Uh, my previous role was uh, supply chain design and engineering. So we were looking after supply chain of large customers and, and finding solutions for them to improve it. Uh, and that kind of gave some insight to the work I'm doing today uh, and bringing uh, quite a better understanding of what is it that uh, we should do for our customers. Ares, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Thank you very much, Alexis. Really appreciate and honored uh, to be here. And so what I'm about to share is a little bit uh, an insight from uh, the way Maersk seeing things right now. And definitely the Maersk perspective is coming from a global supply chain. But today what we're basically doing is an end-to-end -end supply chain for customers. And that's allowing us to, to basically get and support the uh, customer's request. If we take uh, 10 years ago, we had the volcanic ash cloud over Europe. Uh, in Iceland, uh, it was an eruption of, of uh, volcanic uh, that basically disrupted totally all the flights into Europe. That caused a huge uh, supply chain disruption. People that needed uh, to move goods fast, uh, didn't have the ability to do it by air freight, and that's kind of created some disruption uh, for the Europe continent. Just a year after, in Japan, Fukushima meltdown. In, in that region, in that area of Japan, there is certain memory that has been produced, and that's created some supply chain disruption, at least for the PCs and computers uh, and high-tech uh, industry. So similar to that in Thailand at the end of uh, 2011 and the beginning of 2012, uh, we had the floods in Thailand that, that uh, and, and Thailand is the capital of the world in terms of hard disks. Uh, that's created a huge disruption in, into uh, the tech industries. A few years after that, 2014-15, the worst cost uh, labor strikes that shut down ports. Uh, in 2017, Maersk was one of the impacted by the North Petia uh, virus. Uh, all our system went down within a day. Uh, no more IT system uh, to, to support the operation. And that was uh, Maersk as, as the largest uh, carrier in the world with about 20, 25% of the ocean containerized logistics, that's created a huge disruption in, in the market. It was not only us, of course, it was many other companies, but, but only that uh, and the ports that related to that, it already was a, a huge disruption. Of course, COVID-19 that uh, started uh, the end of uh, 19, and it's, it's, we are in the middle of it right now, that's creating and, and bringing the awareness of disruption uh, once again. With that in mind, you can see that of course, it's pandemics, but it can be a human-made problem. It can be natural disasters. It can be labor availability and strikes. It can be IT failure and IT related, which is also kind of a man-made, right? Definitely bringing us to kind of, we need to get prepared. We need to be ready. If you're not ready, there is a huge potential for companies collapsing. And I'm sure that some of the companies will not made and will not survive this current disruption. Those kind of uh, unpredictable markets demand and volatility creates different needs uh, for supply chains. 
Uh, you can get requests from customers to get cargo much earlier in, in, in their supply chain or in, in their DC. You can get requests uh, that the warehouse is full. You need to actually change things. Uh, you can get requests, please bypass this uh, DCs and go directly to final customers or to the store. There is a lot of different requests that supply chain needs to be started to, to look into and, and become much more flexible than it used to be. You cannot just have a supply chain that is built on one set of rules and you don't have a backup to that. Flexibility, speeding up, slowing down, it's definitely a key to sustain uh, volatility in supply chain. One of the things that can support such, such design of network is a promise of an end-to-end lead time guaranteed. A normal transit time from Asia to, to the US, for example, from the moment it's ready at the factory until it's arrived to the DC, it's around the 40, 45 days, plus minus 13 to 15 days. This is a huge variation across the supply chain. It's very difficult to plan and decide things based on such a huge variation. Reduction of that lead time variation is, is definitely a key to the future of supply chain improvement and resiliency. Visibility all the way of your supply chain, 100% visibility is crucial to have it. And you need provider or, or support from providers that have an end-to-end uh, capabilities to actually execute the supply chain as, as such. For example, you need to come within certain amount of days from origin in Asia to Memphis, DC. The easiest way to do it is of course coming to the West Coast and enter over there, and, and of course, truck from there to Memphis, you arrive to the destination. But is it the right way to do that? Probably for certain times, but not always. You definitely need the flexibility to say, hey, now I don't want to go from the West Coast. I actually want to delay it. I'll come from the East Coast. Or maybe I would first bring it into a DC or, or a warehouse that can actually store it for a while and act on it only when I need it or some places that can actually, a deconsolidation place that can actually give me the ability to go and distribute it to different destinations. So that can actually be a cross stock uh, kind of capabilities. I'm sure that um, you feel that, oh, wow, with all this uh, flexibility, it definitely must uh, cost me more to run such a supply, a supply chain. But my answer to that is not, not always. Uh, this is kind of just an example of an end-to-end uh, reduction uh, of, of viability that uh, we worked with one of our customers. Originally, it was about 40 days with a plus minus 13. So anywhere from 27 to 53 days that they can arrive to the destination uh, all the way from origin. Uh, we built a solution that is a 29 days plus minus three. So yes, In the origin solution, you can come at 27 days, you have a good chance to come very fast. Uh, But at the end of the day, uh, there is a lot of uncertainty when this will arrive, when cargo will be there. And that's creating a much more inventory acquisition. And we basically starting to build more inventories in a warehouse, which costing us definitely a lot of more uh, money. So reducing that inventory, uh, the safety stocks in our warehouses, basically help to actually reduce the final uh, amount of money that we're spending on our supply chain. Uh, another quick example on that is, is an example of a, a normal regular solution where uh, cargo arrives at the port of uh, these cases in LA. It is been uh, basically goes to the final uh, port, the inland port. So there is another uh, move of the 40 foot containers goes to the uh, surrounding of Memphis. And then from there you have another provider come and take this 40 and bring it to, to the final. Here is actually uh, Fort Worth Dallas. There is uh, multiple handovers and your 40 foot container is, is keep moving around. And actually this is the one that, that uh, moving to the final destination. Because of the multi vendors and multi handoffs, uh, the transit time from arrival to the port all the way to destination is something between six to 10 days, something that uh, you have a variation. The cost of that is actually more expensive. An alternative to that is basically you're taking it into a, a, a warehouse located very close to the port, 
You convert the 40s into 53 trailers. You can save on the environment impact. You can save on the movements of 53s that actually move to your destination. And you can create much better accuracy of the transit time. And we can see in this example that we have eight to nine days. So yes, it could be, it is still higher than the six to the six days that we have in the original example, but the, it's, it's definitely much more accurate and you can plan much better around this. And of course, at the end of the day, it's also creates some cost reduction to the customer here in this case is $300 uh, saving. Yes, it sounds more expensive to have flexibility and solutions, but there are ways to actually uh, go around it and, and create some kind of uh, measurement to actually that uh, help you to save. Having all those type of preparation definitely help, uh, but it's not all. Uh, you need to build solution in advance. You need to build ways to be flexible, uh, but you also need to kind of think, what alternative do I have for certain things that I'm depending on? And, and as I mentioned before, one of the... Uh, things that can create some uh, disruptions, it's, it's actually the human being. Uh, we have shortage of human being work, willing to work in, in the certain environments. And uh, I, I'm not thinking that people will disappear from warehouse anytime soon, but definitely we need to have alternatives and we need to have certain uh, potential ideas. So just certain things that we are working on. Uh, this is an autonomous vehicle uh, that we are testing basically uh, in, in the yard. And the idea of that is to create another set of uh, pool. For example, uh, in the middle of the night when people uh, do not prefer to work uh, in those shifts, we can actually uh, rearrange all the containers in the yard and bring them into the right position that we can actually work early in the morning when people arrive. Uh, another uh, solution that we're exploring right now it's container unloadings. And there are different types of machines doing that today, going inside the container and starting to unload uh, cartons and, and bringing them to, to a conveyor that wait behind that and start to sort. Yeah, I'm calling this machine the Cookie Monster. Uh, it it's sounds like it's, it's going inside and eating the boxes uh, with suctions and with other kind of equipments that bringing it in a much faster speed than we could do manually. Uh, beside the uh, automation, of course, any company that would like to be ready for uh, such a disruption or, or such a volati volatile uh, time need to build a business continuity process. The number one is, is to ensure that safety of people and then you have safety of infrastructure. That's the second thing. If your infrastructure is still available, accessible, that's definitely help you to be able to, uh, to work on solution and create solutions. Of course, there could be times that infrastructure goes under, under the water, for example, literally in Thailand, the floods or, or other different things that you just can't access those infrastructure. Then you need to have some continuity planning uh, where you're going to move people, will they work from home, will they work from a different location. Uh, so the crisis management is the next things that, that needs to be uh, executed. Structure training crisis management team needs to be in place and needs to be the one that's handing everything. Uh, we call it the war room, basically. You know, people that are capable to give the right communication, ensuring that people getting one source of information and correct source of information, it's a very crucial to success uh, in, in managing any crisis. And then at the end of, uh, of after this uh, initial plans, the business continuity planning needs to take over, creating a business risk assessment, uh, ensuring that uh, all the offices, we have documentation of what you do, how you do things, uh, what is happening with the operation, who is doing what? For example, what happened if you have somebody infected with the coronavirus in your facility? What is it that you're doing? How you return to normal operation and making sure that the operation is, is really capable to do that? Of course, the process needs to be, uh, be planned with the business continuing plan, uh, planning. Uh, you need to document and ensure that uh, you have the right infrastructure 
people knows how to do things even they are not in the office. Uh, IT needs to be supported. Uh, the first few days of, of this uh, coronavirus, we saw that our IT bandwidth started to get heated by all this conference call and video calls. Took about two days to execute the plans and, and we're back to normal operation that people could actually do all those video conferences and video calls uh, over the internet uh, without disruption. So that is definitely one of the key things in order for us to, to success in, in, in mitigating those kind of uh, situations. Great, thank you so much, Rez. That was really insightful, really interesting, and brought some good perspectives. My question is, how do we deal with this when it's such an extended situation where it's gonna, you know, it's not a few days long, it's not a few weeks long, it's gonna be months long to a year long. How do you see Maris responding in that way? And in general, any suggestions you have for those on the line? Definitely the number one thing, as I, as I mentioned, is definitely ensuring the safety of the people both our own employees and, and the people around and everybody in the community. So that's the number one priority that we, we have to take care of. The second thing is, is communication. We have to build some communication methods and skills uh, that ensure that the visibility kept going and, and people understand what is it uh, that's happening. Uh, the whole chain needs to be communicated constantly, even daily or multiple times a day. Definitely, if it's becoming an extended impact and situation, I, I do suggest, and I think that we are also taking the same approach, is delay unnecessarily project. You will need a, a cash very soon. Things will change. And, and in order to free cash, any unnecessary project, delay it or stop it for now. One of the things that uh, we see with our customers is that the, the feedback that we get from them is that they're really happy that uh, they're working with a logistic provider that can give them the flexibility uh, and the solution on the end-to-end. -end. So alternative uh, routing, alternative solution, different ways to do things and, and make sure. And I think one of the important things to remember is don't panic. Everybody learn about the bullwhip effect. When it's reached to a point that uh, we're starting to react with no control, we're creating a huge supply chain uh, effect. And that's definitely something that needs to be kind of been taught and planned and see, do I do it because I'm panicked or do I do it because this is the right thing to do? Supply chains were largely invisible to the lay audience, to the public, to, to many people. And now they're in, the, they're in the limelight. We're seeing the critical role of supply chains. Can you talk a little bit about what you think emerging role of the supply chain professional will be? Uh, so I do advise people to keep search and explore for alternative out-of-the-box thinking and ensure that uh, the business continuum plan is, exists. It's, it's, it's a crucial to have it and make sure that you and your provider have those kind of uh, planning around. Are there things, and I, you've alluded to these, but maybe pinpointing them, some future-oriented practices that companies can think about now to internalize as we, internal, as we enter a period of recovery? So uh, I think, I think uh, there's a lot for us to do, uh, to build for the future, to be ready. One of the things will be to build a cross-functional team senior management and experts in different fields, just to be sure that we are, ad we are addressing all the supply chain risks and we're preparing for them. We call it war room in the bigger scale. And when we talk about different locations, we call it cockpit. So definitely that's kind of an important thing to, to do and to plan for. Decision that you make, definitely make those decisions to protect the bottom line, not the procurement cost. I will challenge you guys to think about the bigger picture, the bottom line, and, and protect that one. Uh, definitely, uh, this is important. Uh, another, part, another point is, is definitely to develop a supply chain visibility. Uh, without the visibility, you cannot take action. You are basically goes in the dark. And we see that uh, in certain companies that do not have the visibility, they have no clue where the cargo is, where is the PO is. Uh, when it will hit this location or that location. So in order to actually have actions, you need to have the visibility. So that's definitely something to be prepared for. Use more uh, integrated uh, supply chain providers. Uh, as I mentioned before, it helps with the flexibility, uh, the visibility, and they reduce the time to market. 
Of course, if you can consider multi-country sourcing or, or different locations to be sourced from, not always easy, uh, but, but definitely something important to think of. Definitely request your supply chain providers to share their plans uh, to, for disruption time. So if they have any plans, uh, that's definitely need to be shared so you can actually work together to come up with, with solutions for that. This is great, thank you. One question from Amanda is, is the Cookie Monster uh, also available for pallets? So yeah, I saw solutions that are available for pallets. It's not exactly the way the cookie monster work, but it's going to be, I don't know, a mini cookie monster. There are solutions to unload the pallets from containers. Is there is the cookie monster doing damage to the packages, cartons that are moving through? Uh, so, so the testing that uh, we are looking after, there is basically so far was no damage or, or less than 1% of damage in the one that we tested. Uh, we are testing a different one right now that is basically zero damage. It's it's moving as fast as uh, as the Cookie Monster, but but in a different uh, uh, different uh, way, and that's definitely zero zero damage for now. Great, thanks. So Crystal asks, um, what do you see about the trend for? And we're going to try not to get too political here, but uh, deglobalization. Is there a trend for dual supply chains to cope with? these global trends and, and your perspectives on that? Uh, definitely it will impact uh, the supply chain. Prices will change. People will have to rethink where they're sourcing their goods from. Uh, but that's bring us back to the idea of let's create more than one locations that we are sourcing because even if we want it or not, we cannot just eliminate China or eliminate uh, Mexico, or eliminate somewhere else around the supply chain. There is going to be always a need, both from supply and from demand, to keep working with the whole work. I know that there is a lot of different voices nowadays that we need to definitely look at our own people first. But if we want to keep the way of living that we live today and, and all the accessibility that we have to products, we definitely will have to keep uh, the ability to work globally rather than just locally. So then we have a big question from, from Sumia. How does Maersk incentivize supply chain partners to share data? I think the best way to incentivize people that can share data is to give them data back. So that's kind of the best way uh, to do that. We have to also remember that a lot of the data that we have is actually generated from within the company. Uh, because we own both supply chain management, so we have all the information from our customers on the PO level. We're helping with the vendor management. We have that information. We, ha we have the ports uh, with the APM terminal ports. We have the vessels themselves. So many different type of information is already coming uh, within uh, the company itself. Of course, there's, it's, it's uh, limited for our own uh, kind of uh, capabilities. So when we need air freight type of information or other carrier information or trucks information, definitely not the number one is give and take. The second one is, of course, you pay per use uh, when needed. Right. Thanks. Uh, so now this one's going to really press our, our, our brains here, which is we have this ongoing crisis with COVID-19. And now in Southeast U.S., we'll soon have a hurricane on top of the COVID situation do, does crisis response or, or planning take into account multi, multiple emergency events at one time? And what are your thoughts on that? Uh, definitely multiple things uh, needs to, to maneuver and take care at the same time. I think it will uh, impact the way we work. It's going to create us uh, look at things in a different way. Uh, the way we are handling that is, is as I mentioned before, is uh, having a war room plus cockpits in, in the different uh, sections within the company uh, to ensure the flow of information and flow of communications is coming and going from, from the different uh, angles of, of the business that is, is moving around. Right. Um, so Musas asks, are you seeing a difference in how companies are moving their goods? Are there certain trends you're seeing there? Oh, definitely. Definitely. There is a huge change, 180 degree change of the way people used to do things uh, until a month ago and how they move in today. Uh, the number one thing that we see is a huge 
uh, request for air freight and charter uh, air charters uh, operations. Uh, uh, this is for everything that needs to be done uh, fast uh, for all the medical support and, and uh, uh, sanitary equipment, et cetera, et cetera. It's today moving by air freight. There's no ocean involved in that. There is, but the number one thing is going by air freight. So, so huge uh, constraint. And, and remember that most of the capacity in the air freight world is in passenger aircraft. Uh, I, I would estimate it to be 60-70% of the world capacity is actually in, uh, in the belly of passenger aircrafts. When those aircrafts are not moving, we are moving to charters. And there is a certain amount of charters or freighters available in the market. So we see airlines that are taking the seats out of the passenger or other airlines that putting cargos on top of the seat and, and putting nets. So that's number one thing that's uh, happening. Uh, when we're talking about, about oceans, uh, a lot of the distribution centers are full and closed uh, and they cannot take more cargo anymore because all the stores are closed and there is no release from the DC. So people are looking for uh, store containers for us. Uh, can you reroute it via different locations so it will arrive later than before? So cargo that used to go into the West Coast now being requested, please route it into the East Coast Get, let gain another uh, 10 to two weeks uh, time on the water so we don't need to find solution for that and by then hopefully things will change. People are asking to they want to reduce the detention demarrage on the containers so they're asking for solution to get off cargo and put it in temporary storage in warehouses. Get a different request of can you now break the cargo take only the emergency goods or the things that needs to be used for emergency, bring them to the, the, the final destination and the rest you hold for now. So there is multiple different requests nowadays uh, to change supply chains of, of the customers. Right, now, super interesting. I'm thinking about all the different changes going on right now. Um, so David asks, is Maersk making agreements with third parties for increasing capacity or is that managed internally? Any additional advice related to flexibility? The simple answer on, in terms of do we do uh, capacity management with others, the answer is yes, right? Uh, there is alliances in the world today and, and definitely each carrier has backups, including MERS with other carriers in, in increasing capacity. Uh, but the main flexibility is not coming uh, just because of you get more capacity. A lot of the time, actually, the carriers would like to reduce capacity because it's impacting. Uh, you cannot operate a capacity if it's not bringing a certain amount of income because otherwise you're actually losing money for every voyage. So there is a lot of times that you actually reduce capacity just to maintain certain rates. Uh, but the, the real potential thing in order to create uh, flexibility is to be able to have your own capacity and control of every element in the supply chain. So if, for example, the ocean port to port is being slowed down because of whatever reason, and there is always a, something can happen. You cannot create a bullet-proof point-to-point uh, uh, -point supply chain. You can create a much better resilience end-to-end -end supply chain by be, a, be able to actually control everything in the supply chain and mitigate those problems along the way. So if you have all the end-to-end -end, uh, capabilities and you have the ocean portion is actually being delayed right now or uh, alternatively arrive earlier, you can actually uh, slow down or speed up uh, when you move things through the warehouse or through the trucking or through... Uh, so that's basically the way we're creating uh, flexibility. And on top of that, you have to have uh, the visibility. As I repeatedly again, uh, Visibility is the, is the key for everything. Do you have a, a prioritization or classification that Maersk pri excuse me, prioritizes humanitarian cargo? And how, how do you deal with that? Yes, definitely. We have a, a government and, and aid uh, section within the company that supports uh, FEMA and all the other kind of uh, uh, global organization that definitely get uh, number one priority uh, for this type of uh, equipment and goods that needs to support uh, the life of people. We are prioritizing. Um, Jose, or excuse me, Jose now asks, um, could you say something about the current shipping container shortage? 
Definitely a lot of the cargo is, as I mentioned before, is being stored in containers nowadays. People are asking to find solution for the yard and impacting uh, the ability to uh, move containers into the location. Certain companies that need those containers for exports, uh, we see them willing to pay money to move empty containers from the ports into the inland uh, portions of the country. Certainly something that you don't see in normal days. Normal days, they are taking advantage of the empty containers being in those places. Uh, but nowadays, when you have a shortage, people get creative and, and finding solution to, to get that. But, but the more cargo will be stuck inside containers, the more we'll see shortage with that. And we'll have to find alternative solutions. One of the way could be to move things in the 53 uh, trailers, bring them into the port if you need to export, and basically convert it back to 40s in the port area. That could be an, an alternative solution that we're working with some of our customers nowadays. Thanks for that. So another question for Soren is asking about uh, oil prices right now and the fluctuation. Uh, how is that impacting you know, Maersk's strategy is in, in any way? So I'm, I'm not an oil expert, but uh, I know that uh, the way we're dealing with oil is based on, on the market. Uh, we're not bankering any oil or fuel in advance because that's kind of becoming more of a gambling exercise uh, to understand. So we take and, and push back this uh, up and downs with, with the customers and we work with them to, to ensure this is uh, sustainable to all. Uh, Carlos asked, do you think uh, this global situation will create new business models for the supply chain? Yeah, I'm sure it will. I'm sure it will. Uh, as, as we spoke before, people are looking for different uh, ways to, to move the cargo. I think uh, at least the way we see it internally, one of the key things to enable uh, companies is, is the end-to-end -end supply chain guarantee uh, of, of transit time or, or reduction of variation. So Rui asks, in Maersk, is there a team or any individuals fully allocated to emergency response crisis management? Oh, yes, definitely. There is a team uh, that dedicated to that. Uh, we have uh, the protocol of these people are not sitting idle the, year, the whole year round. They are coming from the different businesses and they are part of a disaster uh, recovery team. And the moment that something goes on, basically, we initiate this team and bringing them back to the war room and ensure that there is an execution of the plan that we, we set in place. So those teams are fully aware what they're supposed to do. They're part of uh, regular discussions and building up the, the recovery plan uh, during the year. So yes. Great, thanks. Uh, so we're coming to the end of this awesome session. I just wanna thank you so much, Rez, for taking your time. I know you are managing a million things right now, so I really thank you for taking the time. Final, final question. Any words of wisdom as we sign off? Uh, I can only offer wisdom when in supply chain. <laughs> Definitely see, see the bright side of things. Uh, uh, supply chain is being disrupted, but uh, it, it shows that it's necessary to plan and necessary to build things. So in the last 10 years, we repeatedly have uh, different disruptions, maybe not in this magnitude that the whole world is shut down, but there are constantly things that uh, disruption disrupting our supply chain. And, and when it happens, people, yeah, we need to do that. We need to do that. And then the moment it's over, yeah, let's go back to normal. We forget about this. So, so definitely uh, encourage you to work on that. Make sure that you have this protocol in place and, and you actually refresh them within time and, and checking that they're still valid and workable. Uh, people that might be impacted uh, in the short term in, in terms of work. Uh, I believe that you definitely going to find yourself in, in a good situation after it's all over, when more and more company will want to have those expertise and capabilities in place. So, so definitely uh, uh, remember that. Uh, keep, keep doing the good stuff that, that you're doing, because I think people that are in the supply chain are the number one crucial to make sure things are moving and, and flowing. So, so definitely a good job for everyone that's involved in supply chain. Thank you so much, Rez. Those were great words of wisdom to sign off by. Thank you and everyone stay safe and healthy. Thank you, guys. All right, everyone. Thank you for listening. 
I hope you enjoyed this edition of MIT Supply Chain Frontiers. My name is Arthur Grau, Communications Officer for the Center, and I invite you to visit us anytime at ctl.mit.edu or search for MIT Supply Chain Frontiers on your favorite listening platform. Until next time.